Good morning. I want to welcome everyone here. It is once again my privilege to be able to stand before you to speak from God's Word. And if you would be turning your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 of this particular passage. And I want to read the passage. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but I do want to read the passage before we get further into the lesson to go ahead and lay the groundwork of what we'll be talking about. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1, we can read, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understood, or understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made out of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. When you look at this particular text, Hebrews chapter 11 is considered the great chapter of faith, of exemplified faith of those who not only believed God but obeyed God. And we're introduced to several characters in this particular chapter and their behavior. We're told that they behaved the way they did because of their beliefs. And we can also find a strong correlation between that which we believe and how we act today. You can look at that in Hebrews 11, but bring it up to our day, to our lives, your life, my life. And the way we behave is the way we believe and also the way we're going to act. Hebrews 11:6 tells us that we must believe that God exists and as a result, he's going to reward those, notice, those who diligently seek him. Not just those who say, oh, I believe in God. He's going to give me heaven just because I believe in him. No, it says in this passage, you diligently, with every fiber of your being, seek him. And folks, that determines our behavior. That determines our life. This is what those ancient Bible believers or Bible characters believed. Hence we see their behavior here. And if we're going to seek to follow their examples, then we first need to begin with what we need to believe. The lesson this morning is entitled, Does It Matter What We Believe? Now I see people all the time that will want to argue this very point. They will argue the title. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you feel good in your heart. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're a nice person. But then they go out and do all sorts of wickedness and think it, they, their wickedness is justified because they feel so good in their heart. Or because they think, well, I'm a nice person, so God's going to justify me. Has nothing as far as being nice. We ought to be nice to one another. We heard a lesson about that yesterday. But at the same time, just by being nice is not going to get us to heaven. We have to be faithful Christians, godly people. In today's religion, there be those who say it really doesn't matter what you believe. 
I've had that said to me before. It doesn't really matter as long as you're sincere in your heart. And they're always pointing right here. Well, that old heart's going to stop one day, but he's talking about your mind. The central point of your thinking. Who you really are. Who I really am. That's the mind. And we have to train our minds to be the kind of people we need to be and must be if we're going to go to heaven. We know that in religion in general, there are many people who are inconsistent with it. There are those who will, will say, well, I'm going to heaven because I believe. But then they go out every weekend to the bars, they get drunk, they commit fornication, do whatever else they want to do and think that it's not a big deal. I mean, I've had people tell me that, and David I know over the years, and anybody who's been a Christian, even at work, probably you have had people say the same thing to you. Oh, I'm sincere, so I'm going to go to heaven. Are you truly sincere if you're not following God's word? No, you're definitely not. They will firmly proclaim that it does not matter what you believe as long as you feel good about what you're doing. But we're going to talk about this morning that it does matter what we believe. And it matters what we believe because our first point, our beliefs will determine our actions. What we believe in our, in our heart, in our mind, will determine how we behave, how we act, what we do. And people will see that in our lives. They will see that if we are living a faithful Christian life and either commend us for it, sometimes they will criticize us for it. They'll criticize us and say, well, you're one of those Bible thumpers. You're this, you're that. They want to pigeonhole us into something in their own way of thinking that we're wrong because we want to follow the Bible. And by us following the Bible, we condemn them in their lives whether we say that or not our faithful lives will condemn the sinner's life and they don't like that. They just want to be left alone and live however they want and think they're going to heaven. And sadly enough, they're not because they're not following God's law. We act according to our beliefs just like back in our text, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. He's dead yet his influence lives on. He's been dead for thousands of years, yet we still see in faith's hall of fame in chapter 11 that Abel was a righteous man. He did what God told him to do. Cain did the opposite because he was a tiller of the ground, a farmer. Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground. Abel offered an animal sacrifice. Now, do we see something specifically in Genesis 4 where God said you can only offer an animal sacrifice? But God had told them that. How do we know? It's implied in the text in Genesis 4 that Abel was righteous because he offered what God wanted. Could Cain have done the same thing? Absolutely, but he chose not to. That's on Cain, not on Abel. Cain sinned when he did that which God specific did not do that which God specifically told him he must do in offering a sacrifice and bring it down to the modern world today. It's exactly what people in religion in general do. They do what they want to do. In their own mind, they're offering their own kind of sacrifice of however they want to live. But it's not according to the Word of God. Hebrews 11, 7. Noah acted by faith according to his beliefs. By faith, Noah being warned of God as of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah was warned of God on something that had never happened before. They had never seen it rain on earth before. And he said, I'm going to destroy this world by flood. I want you to build an ark. Not just any ark. He gave him the specific dimensions that he wanted it built by. 
And what did Noah do? Did exactly as God said. He didn't do any shortcuts on the ark. He didn't say, well, God, you know, I, I think I can build it this size. This would be just as good as what you said. God gave the specifications, the blueprint, and Noah followed it to the letter. Noah obeyed God. And it said he prepared that ark to the saving of his house. He and his family were saved. Eight people, all that were saved on the earth at that time. Everyone else decided to reject what Noah was doing. They very likely thought he was a crazy old man. Why are you building a boat in a place where there's no water and say that there's going to be water and it's going to flood everything and people are going to die? They didn't take it seriously until it was too late. And then they wanted an ark, but the doors were shut. And once that door of safety was shut, it wasn't going to be opened again until God said it was going to be opened again. You think about these recent floods that took place over east of us. Florida got hit by that hurricane, and as it went up in Georgia and Tennessee, it just dumped massive amounts of water. I've watched numerous videos and just in awe of how much water was dropped in a short period of time and the amount of floods that have occurred over in that part of the country. And yet that pales in comparison to what God did in the flood. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, the Bible teaches us, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, does it matter what we believe? Absolutely. Because what comes out of our mind is what our mouth is going to speak and what our bodies are going to do. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We need to keep our hearts, guard our hearts, to make sure that we're thinking right, acting right, doing right. Because out of it are the issues of life. Again, what's in our mind comes out in our either our mouth and or our actions. So we need to be careful. And we need to be faithful to God no matter what others in this world do. If we believe the right things, we will act in the right way. In Matthew 25, 35 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. Now that's the first part of the verse. We'll get to the latter part just in a minute. But a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. Notice he uses good three times in the first part of this verse because he's a good man out of the good treasure of his heart living the life he needs to be living, being faithful to God as he should be, is bringing forth good things faithful, right actions in his life or her life. Matthew 6, 22 says, The light of the body is the eye, and therefore if the eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. What is he talking about if the eye be single? The eye is focused on what is good and holy and right. The good eye. Now you can tell, and a lot of you have them as well, glasses. I've got my glasses. And without them, if I take them off, everything on this page is blurry. I can't see anything. Because my eyes are getting bad. I'm told that's with age, but it's been happening for a while. But those things happen to us. So we have to have something to correct the vision so we can actually see. Well, if our eyes are bad spiritually, we're looking at, doing, and acting in the ways that's unbecoming of a Christian. We have to focus in on the goal. That goal is heaven. But also if we believe the wrong things, we're going to act incorrectly. Very opposite of what we just talked about. Now look at the latter part of Matthew 12, 35. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Again, three times the word evil is used here. In contrast to the good man. The evil man is going to bring forth evil things out of his evil heart. We're living in sin. 
that describes us. And those who do live in sin, according to God, are considered evil. But how many people in religion today will tell you that they're evil people? They're not. They're going to say, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I know how I feel in my heart. I feel like I'm a good person. But they're not living a Christian life. Are they actually good? No, they're evil. We use that term good and evil a little bit differently in our society today than what God uses it in the Bible. Because we think of evil people as murderers and rapists and drug dealers and people breaking the law. Those are evil people, but everybody else is good. Morally, maybe to some extent. Spiritually, not at all. You can have some of the nicest people in the world, the people that you hear them say, they give you the shirt off their back. And according to God, if they're not a Christian living a faithful life, they're evil. But we don't want to say that because that might offend somebody, won't it? But that's what they are. And sometimes we have to just tell them, no, you're not a good person spiritually or morally because you're not a Christian and you're not living a faithful Christian life. And that's hard, and I know people don't like that, but that's the truth. Different beliefs determine different actions. Some beliefs determine what we trust. Who or what we trust determines other beliefs. And we want to trust in right things. We want to trust in holy things. We don't want to trust in those things that are wrong. Just consider the belief that some people have like with witchcraft or sorcery. We think, oh, that's way out. People don't do those kind of things now like they did. Yes, they do. Horoscopes. When I was young, I'd pick the paper up. I thought it was comical reading the horoscopes just to see how foolish they were. I don't do that anymore. don't care about it. But I got a big laugh out of, of reading some of those horoscopes. But you know that some people don't get a laugh out of it. They take it seriously. They'll hardly even get out of bed before they read the horoscope to know if they need to even do anything today or not. They're so superstitious about life that they let things like that guide and govern them with their decisions. Are they making good decisions? No, they're not. We look at God's Word, not a horoscope, not sorcery or witchcraft. I've heard people say before that they are going to place a spell on somebody or, or a curse on somebody. Well, if somebody said that to me, I'd say, bring it on. Give me whatever you can throw at me. Because I don't believe that, and you don't either. Or if you do, you shouldn't, <laughs> because it's not right. But then go further, what about idolatry and materialism? Oh, now we're getting down to where, preacher, you start stepping on toes now, you need to back off. Because a lot of us would agree on sorcery and witchcraft and things like that. But what about materialism? Chasing the dollar, chasing money, chasing fame, chasing fortune, or whatever. If it comes our way, God blesses us with that, we ought to be thankful. But that's not what we're doing in this life. We're not chasing those things. We shouldn't chase after idolatry. Now, idolatry, when we think about it, is some type of statue or idol. But idolatry could be your work. It could be your play. It could be something in and of itself that is harmless but because we focus everything on that and that becomes our God, it makes it wrong. Our jobs are not wrong. We've got to earn a living. But if that's all we think about and all we want to do, and we exclude spiritual things, then something's wrong. We have to earn money to take care of our bills and provide for our family. But all we're thinking about is that, then something's wrong. Now I know nowadays with the economy, we may think about it more because it don't go as far. But we have to also remember God's still blessing us. And God's going to take care of us. doesn't mean we're going to eat steaks every night or any night. But it does mean that God's going to provide for us the things that we need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What has He been talking about in Matthew 6? About 
being fed and clothed and taken care of. But we have to put our faith and trust in God. Not in man and not in this world. There's some beliefs that determine also how we worship. If we worship correctly, we know God's going to be pleased with us. But if we worship incorrectly, we offer vain and empty worship. But then there are some beliefs that determine how we personally behave. Personal behavior is important to society. Offensive behavior creates disorder and confusion. Now you think about personal behavior. It is important to society. If we go out and act in a way that not only is unbecoming as a Christian, but that is unbecoming of a civilized nation or a civilized society, and we start acting like animals, and that happens a lot in our world today, in particular in our country, then we have lawlessness and disorder. And thus, that's part of my job, to stop lawlessness and disorder. And yet, it still happens. You could have police on every corner of every street, of every city, in every state throughout this nation and you're still going to have criminals breaking the law. Not going to stop it completely. But when people are in disorder and they behave in a disorderly fashion, there has to be accountability. And that's with all of us. I don't know if y'all keep up the news. Over in San Jacinto County, there were three fire marshals arrested and charged with felonies this past week. And I read their charges and kind of caught my attention, especially. But I read their charges and what they did. And if the things they're saying about them are true, they need to be in prison. I'm a police officer. And I'm telling you, they need to be in prison. Some people say, oh, y'all protect each other. I will when they do right. But when they do wrong, I'll throw them under the bus. And there's guys that are apparently, and they're innocent until proven guilty. But at least the charges are saying they've done wrong. They deserve to be there because we're held to a higher standard. But at the same time, any of us as citizens of this country, of this state, of this city, we have the obligation before God to do what is right and live right. Now, I've mentioned before and what I do, there are people who don't like that. Even when I pull somebody over to write them a ticket for speeding or whatever law they break. I've had people curse me, call me names, scream and yell at me, and tell me why don't I go fight the real criminals. Why are you picking on me? Why don't you go out and get the murderers and rapists? I say, we do that too, but right now you're the criminal who broke the law and I'm having to deal with you. And they especially don't like that, and, but that's what I tell them. I'm not a criminal. Did you break the law? Yes, okay, you're a criminal. Different types of criminals. Some are minor, you give them a ticket. Some are major, you take them to jail. It's still disorder. And people don't want to be held accountable for their actions. I'm not knocking all young people, but you look at some of the younger generation now that feel more entitled. They'll tell you, I don't have to do what you say. I do what I want to do. Wrong answer. Don't work that way. That's why we have laws in cities, in states, in countries, throughout the nation and the world. Because we have to be held to some sort of standard. And as Christians, we're held to a higher standard anyway, and we should do that which is becoming and right as Christians. It is very important on how we act. And it's just as important, if not more important, of what we believe. Because our beliefs will determine our actions. Next, there are choices and actions that we make, but folks, they have consequences. We act based on what we believe, and there are consequences as follows, follows our actions. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, now verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We reap what we sow. If we sow good things... We're going to reap blessings from God. If we sow bad things, we're going to reap cursings from God or punishment from God. 
So we have to know where we stand and how we live. Now, we don't live in any kind of vacuum. We live in the world. But, folks, we don't live of the world. We have to live here, but we don't have to do what everyone else does. But there are also consequences that affect not only the lives of the person doing those things, but the lives of other people as well. For each and every action we choose, good or bad, there's a ripple effect in the world. If it's good, that ripple effect is a positive influence on other people. If it's bad, it's a negative influence on other people. For instance, there are those who have the so-called innocent fun. It's not always innocent when you can consider the consequences. I've seen people want to do some street racing. Oh, this is fun. Let's do a little street racing. And then one of them wrecks and someone's killed. They looked at that as innocent to begin with until someone lost their life and everybody goes to jail. But someone died as a result of someone else's consequences. I could go on and on and on with those kind of examples. But we need to understand that the things that some people consider innocent, not so innocent because it can affect other people's lives. What about the drunk who gets on the road? Shouldn't be drinking to begin with, number one. But he gets on the road or she gets on the road and then kills an innocent family. Years ago, I know a preacher that whole family was traveling back from a preaching engagement and a drunk hit them head on. I think it killed everybody but one, the wife. The wife was the only one that survived. Recently, we saw a trooper that was hit by a drunk while he was working an, another accident, and he died here recently. You see people on the side of the road, their car breaks down. A drunk hits them. It's not innocent. It affects not only one person, but whole families because of their actions. And there are consequences to those actions. And we need to remember that. Christians who live by the rule of love will choose actions accordingly. Love compels us to have the right beliefs so we can choose the right actions. That's what it means, folks, just in plain, simple English, being a responsible person. When we're responsible, we're doing the right kind of things in the right ways. In Romans chapter 13, verses 7 through 10, it says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill toward his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. When we have agape love, the proper kind of love, we want the best for everyone. And we show that to them by encouraging, helping those who are not Christians, teaching them the gospel, those who are edifying and uplifting one another in the most holy faith, so that as we grow and continue to live here, we can one day have heaven as our eternal home. In Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. God because He does love us, tells us what is right and wrong so we can make these good choices. And where does He tell us this? In His Word. It's laid out in black and white for all of us to read and study. And our final point, and why it is important to believe right, is because happiness results from believing right things. Jesus taught those who believe to have joy. John 15, 11 says, These things have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. He was wanting his apostles particularly to have lives full of joy as they preached the gospel and converted others to Jesus Christ. That all began, well, it began before Pentecost and 
the teachings of Jesus, but when Jesus left this earth and went back to the Father, we see on the day of Pentecost the gospel was preached and souls were saved as a result of it. We have to know the right way to live. In Acts 2.28 says, Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. The correct belief will bring about joy regarding salvation. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 8, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of joy. Consider the Beatitudes for a moment. We're not going to read all of those. But it tells us how to be happy. Use the word blessed in there. Blessed are, and it goes through these Beatitudes. The word blessed there means happy. And we're happy when we believe the truth. When we live our lives based upon the truth. When we can rejoice that our actions will have the positive consequences that God intended them to have and not the consequences of the evil or wicked people. It's a great reason for us to rejoice, isn't it? So when you think about it, this lesson in talking about on what we should believe and what we must believe is really about good or evil. Good versus evil. How do we live? How are we living? How do we plan on living in the future? Are we planning on being faithful people of God and living a Christian life so that when we draw our last breath, we can be carried into Abraham's bosom into the paradise awaiting the day of judgment to finally hear him say the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or are we living the life where once we depart, we'll be in torment Awaiting that punishment, depart from me, you that work iniquity, for I never knew you. It is important of what we believe. We understand that our, our actions are based upon our beliefs. There are consequences that follow our actions. But finally, the happiness results from believing the right things. So what about your life this morning? In your life, are you living the way you should? Are you behaving and believing the right things in the right way so that heaven can be your home? If not, as a child of God, why not come to God repenting of your sins? Asking for the forgiveness of those things that you know are missing your life, things that you've done publicly. We don't have to know your private faults and private sins. If that's between you and God, then it needs to stay between you and God. David's lesson last week dealt with that. We don't just broadcast our sins. I had a teacher when I was in college. One of our Bible classes made this statement. He said, we're to repent of our sins, not report our sins. And if people don't know about it, don't report it to everybody because they don't need to know. If it's between you and God, keep it between you and God. If it's between you and a few people, keep it between you and a few people. But if you've sinned publicly and you brought shame upon the church, then you need to repent publicly. We're going to give you that opportunity when we sing the invitation in just in a moment. But if you're not a Christian, you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, do you believe with all your heart Jesus is the Son of God? If you do, why not change your life in repentance? Repentance is necessary and probably the hardest command to follow. Because people want to be saved, but they don't always want to make the changes in their lives necessary for that salvation. But once we're willing to give up our own sinful ways and willing to change our lives, then you can confess your faith in Jesus. Do you believe that He is the Son of God? And upon that confession, be immersed in baptism to have your sins washed away by the precious blood of Jesus. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, we urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?